Hey, uh, good evening uh, to, to everyone who has taken time out of their busy schedules to join us this evening. So uh, we, we've got some special guests with us. I'll introduce them in a second. But before we get started, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, first uh, talk about why we're doing this town hall. Everybody knows uh, that we have been uh, trying to get after a new assessment to, to uh, be a better predictor of our performance of our Army Warrior task and our performance in combat. So we've been after that for a couple of years now. In fact, uh, I think the uh, three years to be exact as far as all the studies and research and, and data being collected. And then what we're familiar with is actually the, the pilot programs of actually getting out there and doing the assessment and, and brings us to where we are today. Uh, a test that is uh, being kicked off April the 1st, so a few days ago, for the diagnostic phase uh, to start live one October, depending on what your status is, and then to roll hot for other statuses uh, April of the following year to be fully implemented in, in April uh, of 23. So um, with that, I won't waste a whole lot of time. I will turn it over to our two guests. Uh, first, uh, Sergeant Major of the Army, uh, Mike, Michael Grinston and Brigadier General John Klein from the Center of Initial Military Training. So, SMA. Hey, Sergeant Major Raines, thanks uh, for having me. And uh, if you could just make sure, can you give me a thumbs up that you can hear me clearly? Okay, we got a thumbs up. We have audio, we have visual. Here I am um, from my POW camp, which is in my house. It looks a little creepy. You know, the Army can't afford a you know a good ceiling light, but that's okay. Um, hopefully you can see me fine. Uh, the brief uh, still goes well. Uh, I am safe and secure. It's okay. No, but I appreciate everybody taking their time. Good evening, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, before I even get started um, again, or I'd like to, you know, first by thank all our soldiers uh, that we have right now forward deployed. We have a lot of things that are going on with the soldiers in Europe. We've sent uh, soldiers over to the Baltics. We have soldiers in Poland, uh, and we have all compos over there, Army, Guard, and Reserve. Um, on this mission, for those in Europe, it's usually uh, our active component, but uh, please keep them in your thoughts as they do the mission that the Army has asked them to do. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the uh, the Army National Guard for all that you have done in the last couple of years uh, for your roles, either through capital response, national natural disasters, COVID support, um, sometimes even driving school buses or whatever your country needs. Uh, the Army National Guard has done a fantastic job and I'd like to thank you all and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, but tonight we're talking about uh, getting an update on the Army combat fitness test and the policies and procedures. Um, that's why we're doing this. Leadership matters, and everybody here is going to be a part of that, and I appreciate everybody tuning in. We got a lot of information, uh, but I'd ask you all, no matter what we talk about tonight, please uh, take the time to read the Army directive um, and the execution order. If you can't do that, there's also the Army.mil slash ACFT website you can go to. So we're just gonna jump right in and uh, hopefully you can go ahead and bring up that, that first slide. As I'm kind of waiting for this to, to go, um, this is, let me go ahead and go to the next slide. What we have uh, tonight is the first thing we're gonna talk about is the evolution of the ACFT and what the objectives were. You know, we kind of had uh, the same PT test for 40 years, so I'm pretty proud that we actually finally got it changed. There's been uh, three other attempts to do so. Um, now, this one actually works, so I'm really proud of this, that for 40 years, we got the Army Combat Fitness Test. My goal is this to improve readiness, transform uh, culture, reduce injuries. And this has been many years in development, and, and it's evolved over time. We had ACFT, like the original version, uh, the standards were based off warrior task and battle drills, agent gender neutral, and then take the test or not. Then we went to 2.0 where we said, hey, we're going to add a, an alternate plank. And then for 3, 3.0, the, the, the plank was a permanent member um, on the, the alternate events. And then here, here we are now uh, for full implement, implementation. 
And uh, we had 630 samples of the Army Common Fitness Test and the test scores and everything. So as we get going for full implementation, I'll talk about that tonight. Um, at some point, I think it was around June through December, the National Defense Authorization Act said we could not implement the ACFT until we did a, another independent review. And I'll talk about more of that here in a few minutes. But after that review and after it was completed, what we came up with was uh, the Army Combat Fitness Test is what you have right now. And I'll kind of pause there just for a second to see if the slides pull up. We're at this minute. That's made a slides of broadcasting. Sergeant Major, your mic is muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Give me a thumbs up. There we go. Uh, maybe it's my internet and my house uh, is working uh, very slow tonight or something. I don't know. But okay, we're on slide number three. Here, keep going. Um, here's what we have. After the RAND study is complete, they made several recommendations. I'll talk about those in a minute. And what we ended up with was a general fitness assessment where before we really were leaning towards an occupational fitness test, but we've, we settled on a general fitness test, which is performance normed. So it's based off of age and gender, which is same groups as what we had before with the APFT. Um, and if you look across the bottom of the timeline, um, there are a, a few key dates. I'll talk about the, the key dates for the active component and the Army uh, Guard and Reserve, uh, which is Active Guard and Reserve AGR. So if you're an AGR soldier or an active component soldier, 1 April 22, will begin your timeline for a diagnostic PT test. That diagnostic test will go to 1 October 22. And for all the Active Guard Reserves on 1 October or Active Component 1 October, uh, will be official start of the Army Combat Fitness Test. We've right, dropped so the the numbering. It's not 4.0. It's not 3.1. It's just we'll the Army Combat Fitness Test. It's still six events. Uh, we dropped the leg tuck, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, and the plank is the only uh, event for the core, and then there's still the two mile run at the end. But back to the time October. So 1 October will start for AGR and active component. When I've dropped the and for all PME. So no matter the school system, one army school system, to go into PME after 1 October or initial military training, the ACFT will be your test record. And if you fail, you're allowed to be flagged. Again, active or AGR, that's an ACFT. So say you go and you take your diagnostic, you feel good about yourself, you take another one, or you like that one, you can say, I want to October, I'd like to go ahead and use that one as my test record, and you don't have to take another another one or and that would be valid training. Uh, uh, for those that are traditional uh, guard soldiers fail, uh, uh, that timeline uh, is extended again, active, that'll be one april uh, that you have uh, all the way till then to take your diagnostic and then after one april that'll be your timeline that you begin flagging soldiers if you have not passed a pt test you have to pass it you'll take a test in april if, you're, if you if you don't pass don't by then, you will be flagged, and, that would be and you're willing to be separated uh, for those uh, in April twenty fourth. So your timelines, that time the, is you know, for you all, most of you all, for the guard soldiers, would be extended. This, uh, I think, that's a reasonable time, and that's what part of the RAND study says was to phase it in over time. And what we're doing, give, allowing you more time to go ahead and take that diagnostic in your dual weekends. Um, and then get the test before April and then uh, complete or pass the test for April of 24. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. 
Okay. So Rand, what, how did we get to where we're at right now? A little bit is the Rand completed the study. I already talked about that. Here are the four shortfalls that they they said that we must have, in case you can't read those, has addressed the shortfalls in the ACFT evidence base. Consider ways to mitigate the impacts to the soldiers. Take steps to further support training improvements over time. And that's where I talked about we you know, let it go for more time so that you can have time to pass the test. Uh, institutionalize a formal senior level management structure. And so there is a plan that we'll look at the Army Combat Fitness Test, I think there's workly monthly working groups, but two times a year they'll be briefed up to the Army senior leaders and decide if there's any changes that need to be made. So those are the recommendations that the RAND talked about in the top and in the bottom. Here's what we did um, based off what was in the RAND studies. If anybody would like to read it, I'm pretty sure it's on the Internet or something. So please feel free to go ahead and read through that if you'd like. Um, one of those things it talked about was climate. Uh, we did find a small, very minor change uh, when you get to, you know, really hot extremes or a cold extreme. Um, but there's always there's always some policy in there that says, you know, commanders can decide when to take the PT test and encourage those not to take the Army Combat Fitness test when it's extremely hot outside or extremely cold. And that's another reason why we're giving a long time so you can get those tests uh, when and reasonable other conditions. So we looked at climate. We looked at what's happening with recruiting um, based off of the National Defense Authorization Act they had to. Uh, we really didn't see any changes in recruiting because we already had the occupational physical, physical assessment test. So we didn't change that. And there's no requirement to take the ACF to keep them in the Army. The second, uh, the third thing to look at was um, the retention and see if there's any effects to retention. We don't see any changes to retention based off of the norming of the scales. We expect similar results from the APFT. And then the evidence base, I think it is, we had now, we have 630 samples of the Army Combat Fitness Test, and that's why the, some of the scales are we, the way they are. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Mitigating the impacts, and I'll talk about that when you looked at the scale. And I've already talked about how we're going to implement this training over time. What you had for the active component in the AGR soldiers uh, for timelines for passing a PT test used to be 90 days. And we've extended that to 180 days. And, our, and for the guard, I think it's 240 days. Uh, so we, we've increased that amount of time. Uh, so it uh, gives you more time to go ahead and just pass the, the PT test. And... Um, and then the governance I've already talked about. So if you could go to the next slide and we'll go ahead and show you the scales in case you haven't seen those. Here are the men. You can go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, if you look at this scale, there's a min and a max. There's a whole bunch of numbers in between those two when you get the official scales. Um, when you look at this, uh, you say, how do we get those scales? So you took like the top 5% in each category, in each event. And we just looked at all those 630,000 uh, ACFT scores and says this is where uh, this group uh, scored at the end. Uh, so 5%, uh, you know, or so would max that event. And that's what the, the max is for that group. And then the same thing for the men was a 55%. If, if less than 5% had failed, that's where the men minimum was. And there's there's a little bit of nuance. Not everyone was perfectly 5%, but th that's the rough man. Um, so uh, we did do the plank and the plank standards. We just kind of went and said uh, there were some other uh, organizations the Marine Corps had a plank. Uh, so we just kind of went with some of their scoring scales. Actually, we went a little bit harder than the Marine Corps to make sure that ours was harder than theirs. So, but uh, we had, we didn't have a whole bunch of that on the planks just kind of looked at uh, other services and that's how we got to get to those scores so next slide when you look at this this is the plank versus the leg tuck uh if you are bored and you get a lot of time to read um the rand study encourage y'all to do that it's really exciting um but why did we remove the leg tuck one is for simplicity number two is um is because when you read the RAND study, it talks about validity of the leg tuck. 
Um, it doesn't mean the leg tuck is a bad exercise. Uh, it says that they couldn't validate that the leg tuck was good and showed support for the warrior task and battle, drill, battle drills. That's what Rand said, just that exercise, because some subgroups couldn't do it. And what that means is when you look at, you know, your little uh, diagram there, if you look at leg tuck, it does measure some grip strength, um, upper back strength, so I'm sorry, upper body strength, the grip strength, and the core. So if you don't have grip strength and upper body strength, and you can't do a leg tuck, it doesn't, it won't measure your core strength. So we went with a plank that way we can ensure that uh, we can measure the core strength. But if you look at the, that same page, I think it's on page 14, the RAND study, doesn't mean the leg tuck is bad. So, you know, I made a video the other day, it says, you know, the leg tuck is still alive and well. And some people says, hey, why would you do leg tucks? Because it's a good exercise. It's a multi-component exercise that is, assesses Grip strength, upper body strength, and your core. So I encourage you all to continue to do uh, multi-component exercises and not just go, hey, I'm only going to do these exercises that are listed in the Army Combat Fitness Test. I encourage, I'm assuming that uh, prior to, um, you know, uh, in your, your, your programs when you exercise, you don't just do, I hope you don't just do, you know, did push-ups, set-ups, and run. You had did other other things so the same thing with this uh you should you know branch out and do other things that are not just listed in the army combat fitness test i encourage you all to do that but that's the reason why we took out the leg cook we couldn't validate it was good for each subgroup doesn't mean it's a bad exercise and then we want to keep it simple for simplicity next so i'll just cover this briefly temporary profiles we added in uh what, the walk, the 2.5 mile walk. One of those reasons is we found that uh, when we bought equipment, we bought all the equipment for everybody, Army, National Guard, and Reserves, but the thing we didn't buy was a bike and the rower. Um, so wanted to add an uh, a alternate event for those with a permanent profile that uh, you could do uh, uh, similar to you know running if you didn't have a swimming pool, a bike, or a row. So we added that alternate event back in if you're on a permanent profile. If you're on a temporary profile, don't take the test. You've got a much longer timeline to go ahead and take that test if you're on a temporary profile. But uh, the temporary profile is just like the old APT. No one should be taking the PT test if you're on a temporary profile. If you're on a permanent profile, you should take the events that you can take based off your profile. And for those events that you can't take, um, if you were to be promotable E4, E5, E5, D6, the promotion points would be uh, scored based off the events you take, not the events that you did not take. So if you got, if you didn't take an event, you would get minimum passing score of 60. And that's how you calculate your score if and only you were on a permanent profile. Okay, next. I'll try to briefly cover these. I've talked about a little bit. I'll go by each one this class quickly as I can. Um, so flags for the active component will start in October. For the Army National Guard, that will start, is allowed to start in uh, April of 23. If you're ETSing uh, or, you know, for an active component soldier or anyone, if you want to get out of the Army, I'm sorry, if you're ETSing, uh, and you'd like to re-enlist, uh, you cannot re-enlist if you haven't passed a Army Combat Fitness Test in April. If um, if you can't pass it, you can't extend. You can it may extend up to 12 months, but you cannot re-enlist if you've not passed the Army Combat Fitness Test. For your evaluations and OERs, we're allowed to go ahead and put those on the OERs for the through date of 1 April 23. Uh, if you're commissioning on 1 April 23, we'll start with the commissioning uh, for promotions. Uh, act if you uh, fail, uh, that prohibits a promotion. Uh, you shouldn't get promoted if you're flagged, um, which is no change uh, for the ACFT or the APFT. And uh, pro promotion points uh, for those that have promotion points, you would use your you still use your last APFT for promotion points until. You've taken an AC till we give everybody this, the amount of time to take an APFT. Um, so that gives everybody, I'm sorry, the ACFT, gotta give everybody a lot enough time to take the ACFT. 
And then once we do that, we can add those promotion points in. So the APFT will be used a little bit for promotion points um, for those that may have um, never taken an APFT. Um, you could, if you had a temporary profile, you could be awarded some points. Um, for those that haven't taken an APFT ever, uh, that would be odd, but it could be those. And I think there is a little clause in XOR that allows you to take an APFT in the event you need promotion points. Uh, but uh, you should have taken one of those at some point. Separations uh, for the Army National Guard that will not officially begin until uh, April 24. And as you can see on the timeline, um, for initial military training starting in October of 22, everybody goes through basic training. And I'm sorry, AIT must graduate and have a passing score for the Army Combat Fitness Test. Uh, for all PME, one Army school system, after after one October of 22, it will be, if there is a graduation requirement for the Army for a physical fitness test, it will be the Army Combat Fitness Test, and everybody must pass to graduate, uh, and that will be scored appropriately. For the Army Combat Fitness Test for all components on uh, 1 October of 22, um, which is listed right there on the bottom. Okay, um, that's the down and dirty and fast as I can go through uh, a difficult topic or not really too difficult for us, but uh, I know for most of us, we've been taking this the Army Combat Fitness Test uh, for years. So I appreciate you listening to me and uh, that rundown. Um, I'll kind of ask General Klein if there's anything I missed. If not, uh, we can jump right into the questions. Ready for questions. Ready for questions, May. Okay, let's do it. All right, May. Our first question comes from the uh, New York National Guard, so I'll turn it over to them. I think we're waiting for PFC Wingo, New York National Guard. Okay, uh, so then we'll go to uh, Nevada National Guard. Uh, Specialist Morgan, go ahead. Good afternoon, Sergeant Major of the Army. This is Specialist Moran. My question is, why did the Army change from the language of NDAA 2015 and come up with the standards for age and gender? Why did we go? I think I heard. Uh, why did we go with age and gender neutral? Um, I thought I kind of said that during the brief, but uh, maybe maybe I didn't. But uh, that was one of the recommendations from the RAND study. Uh, when you look at what it said, it says in there, it says we rec they recommended it to go to an age and gender normed as opposed to gender neutral. Uh, and we kind of went with their recommendation in order to get the Army Combat Fitness Test. And that was a recommendation for the RAND study. Uh, General Klein, anything uh, you think I need to add with that? No. Uh, yeah, we just we also just couldn't make the argument to keep the tie there, you know, with the, with the MOSs. So, um, and we needed a test. So here we are. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Army Ranger. Yes, Maeve, if you could also um, talk about the the OPAT and the role that that plays in uh, making sure that we have an assessment, fitness assessment uh, for occupational specialties. Okay. Uh, that's probably a really good one for uh, General Klein, but I'll kind of throw in there a little bit. The uh, occupational physical assessment test is still um, alive and well, where you still have to um, – achieve a higher score uh, based off your occupation if you're a combat arms you have to have an, a higher score in, to get, in order to go to those high physical demands jobs uh, if you do that you're allowed to go in the combat arms if you're not uh, then you have to to go to an, into a, a different job based off how you score on the opat so there are some things that are still available that says hey um you know if you're in a high physical demands job that is still there um, you know, yep. The only thing I would add is the OPAT is uh, it is not based off of uh, age or gender, right? So that's still a neutral test for your occupation. Okay. Thanks, sir. 
All right, our next question comes from the Idaho National Guard. Sorry, Major of the Army, good evening. Is there a concern that without intervention, gender norm scales could cause a regression in the fair treatment and respect of females throughout our organization? What would your recommendations be to help combat males from looking down on females based on the scales and cause problems with individual soldier health as well as unit morale at any echelon? Uh, that's a good question. I'd probably go back to what were you doing for the APFT? <laughs> so did have it for 40 years. So uh, no, there shouldn't be any regression. There are still plenty of things that are age and gender neutral. Uh, we've had 100, over 100 women graduate through Ranger School. So um, I hope any of those men that would be saying uh, different things to women um, because of this test, I hope, um, I, I'd probably just ask them, did they go to Ranger School? If they hadn't, why not? So there's, there's plenty of things that are age and gender neutral. And uh, we have the OPAT's one of those. It's right there. We have Ranger School. And, and believe it or not, the expert infantry badge, uh, the physical assessment for the expert infantry badge is also age and gender neutral. And we've had several women go through there. So there's uh, plenty of uh, other ways that you can say that uh, women have excelled physically. Um, and for those folks that would regress in their mind, um, probably needs to have some counseling um but you know there's there's other ways to to show that we've done that but for anybody that's narrow-minded we just need to go back and say we, we treat everybody equally um and we have some very good schools that people go to that are clearly physically demanding uh and i just talked about a couple areas that we have but there's others Esme, I'll take our next question from social media. It says, Army personnel, were not al Army personnel were not allowed to see DTMS scores, but was Rand able to see any improvement or trends in individuals or groups on events and track any success or progress uh, up to this point? Yes, uh, Ram was uh, had the ability to track all the scores, but none of us could see individual names so rand could say um, here's a person uh, and they've uh, th they did better over time and that's they actually said that they said hey people can pass this test when given time uh, for everyone and it just said uh, that's kind of why we phased it in and gave a little more time to extend the the, the timelines is because they they looked at the data uh, all 630,000 scores, but what we couldn't do is we couldn't correlate it to a name or a person. So th that caused some problems uh, and not having a test of record. It was the test of record, but it wasn't held accountable. Um, if you read through the round studies, said that was a problem too, because until, until you know you're going to be flagged, do you really put forth the effort? Um, do you, until you know you're going to be separated or chaptered, you know, did you do your best? And we saw some scores, you know, for two mile run time for like, you know, 30, 35 minutes. And that's that's an extremely, you know, long time. I think, you know, most people can walk that, you know, in in 30, 30 minutes. Uh, so in the evidence base, they looked at it um, by individuals. And then uh, we did see uh, improvements over time for most or all subgroups and groups um, with the version that they looked at. Um, but again, there were problems. We couldn't apply resources, so they couldn't, they didn't know what would happen, you know, if we did, you know, a remedial PT plan. And they didn't, couldn't tell what would happen when, you know, when it counted and you had to pass for real, what, what was that motivation uh, would be. Uh, so there were some limitations to the test. Uh, but to answer your basic question is, yes, we, we did see improvements over time with the, the old Army Combat Fitness Test. Um, is there anything to add on that? Nothing to add, sorry, Major. Okay, thank you. All right, our next question will come from the West Virginia National Guard. I 
believe it's uh, Captain Lopez from the West Virginia National Guard. So okay. I'm glad I'm not the only, I'm not I'm glad I'm not the only one that has worked through their uh, mute problems here because I can see him talking, um, but uh, he's working through the mute. Sir, uh, you want to try one more time? Sorry, Major, are you able to hear me? Okay. Hey, after, good evening, uh, Sergeant Major. This is Captain Lopez from the West Virginia National Guard. Uh, being in the diagnostic phase we're in now, uh, before we go into full implementation, do you foresee potential any changes to the ACFT? No. No. <laughs> no, no. no. Sir, no, no changes. Um, yeah, we're, you know, there may be maybe something on a scale here or there, but uh, I, right now, I, I really, you know, we got to stop changing. Uh, that's, you know, we've, we've made a lot of changes in three years, which is abnormal. It took us 40 years to get to this point. So, um, you know, we made minor tweaks, uh, but I really don't see probably major changes, you know, on the Army Combat Fitness Test probably for the next, you know, 20 years. Um, there'll, there'll definitely be some changes probably in the scoring uh, do we need 180 days to to pass the PT test for the active component? Do we want to make that shorter? Uh, do we increase the max or the bins? But um, you know, major changes, adding exercises or anything like that. I, I don't. I don't actually see that in the near future. Um, it's just taken us a long time to get to here. One thing we we may do um, is look at. You know, could we look at an occupational occupational physical standard for combat arms for infantry? One standard because you know, you know, you're all infantry, and what's what's that baseline? In other words, uh, relook the occupational standards, and that's what we originally that was part of what we were doing trying to do in the beginning. Like I said, that's why this is a general fitness test. Um, do we want to relook that? So those are the things I think the structure is going to go look at, but the basic test, I'd be extremely surprised if there's any changes to how that test is going to be done in the near future. And I have a follow-on question if you have time. Sure. I'm on yeah, your time, so sir. So what are the expected timelines for units to perform the ACFT? Uh, for example, with other safety uh, concerns and time constraints with this ACFT, do you foresee a unit having to use an entire weekend to perform the ACFT safely? Um, no, I, I think I think you're I'm not sure about your question because it would depend on a unit. Um, a unit to me could be company battery troop all the way to brigade or division. So uh, I'm not sure what unit, but um, a normal, you know, unit company size can complete the Army Combat Fitness Test in about two hours. Um, so, I'll, you know, we extended that all the way out from now for the, the National Guard till April 23, but um, Sergeant Major Raines, you may be able to help me out with this uh, if I'm not understanding the question correctly. Sergeant Major, you're muted. <laughs> At the computer, Sergeant Major. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I definitely uh, don't feel bad now. Hey, how about how about now? We got you. <laughs> Hey, uh, nobody's been in this room, so I don't know how that happened. But, uh, hey, I, I take that in two, two phases. Uh, the safety concern first, uh, you know, one of the purposes of the ACFT is to reduce injuries, you know, uh, more so than what we saw when we were using the APFT. So, so how do we do risk, uh, you know, management is we put things in place like, uh, like the chain teach, uh, like SMA is doing with us tonight. Uh, he teaches, you know, teach your soldiers, which we got a requirement 
uh, in the directive to do this chain teach and teach everybody about the ACFT, uh, but also to uh, the diagnostic phase. Get out there and do it. Uh, yeah, the, the risks are going to be uh, great for somebody who's not doing PT and not doing anything and not putting their body in motion. Uh, there's greater risk for them to go out there if they're doing a deadlift and get hurt. Uh, so, so we've got some things to mitigate the risk for one, uh, which one of that is getting bodies in motion and actually getting after physical fitness training. And then the other thing is your basic troops to task. You already did that when we did APFT. You figured out the size of your unit. You figured out how many lanes you were going to have, how many instructors it was going to take to do it. So uh, it's no different. Uh, it's, it's a little more intensive as far as the requirements go to administer the test with numbers of instructors, but it's still a basic troops to task that you're going to have to look at. So you look at how many lanes you got, you look how many big your unit is, and then you look at the time that it's going to take, and either you add uh, cadre to NCYC's graders, or either you add lanes, or either you say, hey, we're going we're gonna to power down to smaller elements so we can get it done. So, so the answer, I guess, is that we hope it's not going to take a whole drill weekend. We would hope that you would do that troops to task and put it in a manageable amount where it would only take, you know, a couple of hours out of each element's day. And that's the size of elements that you would be uh, given the test to. Thank you both for your response. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add, um, unless we want to talk about the um, also talk about master fitness trainers. There's a lot of master fitness trainers and not just in the active component. Um, and there's a lot in the, you know, in the, the garden reserve. I don't know your exact numbers, but I do know that most of the instructors at the master fitness cars are um, active guard soldiers. Um, and they've helped me out on my fitness plan. So um, there is expertise to teach you how to train before you get to the test. Um, that's number one. Number two is uh, the Army Combat Fitness Test was supposed to be taken by all soldiers starting in October of 2020. Uh, that was active guard and reserve. So I'm kind of hoping, you know, we've kind of worked on a little bit of the kinks on the Army Combat Fitness Test since we told everybody two years ago in one October 20 to take the test. Um, and there's been a lot of units. Um, and I, I actually pull it by state. For the last year, I can tell you uh, what your state did on the Army Combat Fitness Test, but I've watched those numbers. So a lot of states in the Army National Guard have already taken the test. So um, we just took away a leg tuck. The plank was already there. So I'm, I'm really hoping that we've worked out some of the kinks already. And this shouldn't be, oh, my goodness, now let's all of a sudden take the Army Combat Fitness Test. Um, General Klein, uh, could you talk about our uh, master fitness trainers that we've got? Yeah, sure can, SMA. I, and I would start that, uh, you know, in terms of mitigating risk, Costco, um, you know, look look at the doctrine, look at 7-22, look at the ATPs that are associated with it, too. I mean, it's, it shows how to do each one of the exercises. And then uh, SMA is all over it. Um, you know, within CIMT, we've got the Army Physical Fitness School, and then and they're producing master fitness trainers. Um, I think we did a quick count before we started this. SMA and I have started doing the Travel and Road Show. If they were trained um, post-2019, then they are trained on how to do ACFT in that four-week course. And we have about 2,500 that are circulating right now. There's more than that that were graduates that, you know, attended the course prior to 2019. But when we factor since 2019 and those that are probably still in a position where they're, you know, performing as master fitness trainers, about 2,500 out there. We also doubled the capacity at the school, so we used to only do about 800 a year. We're gonna, we started uh, this month uh, producing up to 1600 a year. So, I would encourage your folks to get into ATARs and, and schedule a slot for, for for MFT. All right, Esme, we'll go back to social media for our next question. Um, and we have seen this one a lot, uh, and I know that there is guidance incoming, but uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, using an ACFT score to clear a legacy APFT flag. Yeah, unfortunately, just like we said in the old uh, X order, uh, that is what the old X order said. In case you didn't read it, or 
uh, Army Directive, I can't remember which one it was, and said uh, you cannot clear a uh, APFT flag with an AT- ACFT score. And that was because at the time it was written, the National Defense Authorization Act uh, said um, you should be flagged. Uh, you can't use the ACFT. So uh, if for some unreasonable amount of time since uh, June of 2020, uh, which is when we put that out, that's been almost two years, uh, you've been flagged that long and you're still in the Army. Um, unfortunately, uh, you can't use you know, clear a flag with the ACFT until uh, your timeline, meaning it's only a dynastic. You, can, you can't get that flag removed if you're the active component until 1 October. So that's when you can officially use it um, on that date. Now, I can take it. I can pass it. um, But uh, 1 October is the date that we could put it in and go, you know, you can do administrative flags, both positive and negative. That's why 1 October is adding it to the score. But that would be an extremely long time to be flagged, uh, waiting for the ACFT to come in. so right now there is no intent uh, to take an ACFT to remove your flag. You should pass the APFT. That's me. Just to, before we move on, just to clarify, one October for active and AGR, and then one April twenty three for National Guard. Yes, you're correct. One April twenty three. Okay, our next question comes from the Florida National Guard. Go ahead. Good evening, SMA. Um, this is Sergeant First Class Lauren with the Florida Army National Guard. On behalf of the Florida Army National Guard, my question uh, is: Why did the Army like not revise the two mile run into like a one mile run or a, a mile and a half run like the other components? And why does why did the Army decide to use the hex bar versus just a regular straight bar for the three max deadlift? I'm assuming when you say the other components, you're assuming the other services uh, because the Army and the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve has always had a two-mile run. Um, So we stuck with the two-mile run because we did not want to appear that we were going to lower our standards, and we made that decision um, probably about 2018. (laughs) So uh, we weren't going to change it. There was no need to change it. It, uh, it checks your VO2 max. Um, it is, it's a good uh, representation of the VO2 max. And I believe if you went into the science, you need about 12 minutes to do that uh, check to see if you can achieve your uh, good assessment of your VO2 max. 12 minutes, you know, can you do that in a mile or two miles? Uh, but we, we went with the two miles and I don't see us uh, changing that either anytime soon. So uh, hex bar versus, uh, uh, I believe a straight bar was the question. I think the hex bar allows you to uh, get into a little bit better body posture and get those hips a little bit more forward. What you don't want with a deadlift is to bend your back forward. I think even though a lot of times I use a straight bar um, uh, because you you can find those more commonly, but it's more... um, conducive to watching people bend over more um, when you use a um, straight bar, but doesn't mean you can't use a straight bar. Um, I, I normally use a straight bar, and when I go to the deadlift, I use the hex bar, and um, still works out well for me. I, I did the max once, um, even at my ripe old age of over 50, but um, the set hex bar technically probably would get, not technically, or probably would just get those hip flexors a little more stable, get that back straight. Um, so then make sure you're doing the proper form and not have to bend over. And I'm, I'm not sure, uh, sir, did anything I miss on that? Uh, you nailed it. Better body alignment with that hex bar. It's just, uh, yep. Um, yeah, and two miles because we're, we're the Army. <laughs> All right, SMA, our next question uh, back from social media. Is there any uh, hard definition or or guidance um, on field condition to conduct or not conduct an ACFT? So 
I think what they're asking is, you know, kind of what are those conditions that we're looking at uh, to uh, either use a, a piece of land or not use a piece of land to conduct the APF, uh, ACFT. Um, there was some language in the August 21 uh, ATP 7-22.01, uh, but nothing solid. And, and John Klein, maybe uh, something that you may have a little bit more insight on, uh, just that guidance. Yeah, it, uh, and I'd have to look at the ATP 7-22.01 um, to, to see the language intent behind that, though, because the only thing really that you need to do is the two-mile run, right? So you can do the rest of the test inside of a gym or other places. So as it applies, you're looking for the same kind of uh, parameters that you would look for for the APFT. Um, you don't, you don't want to be doing something where you're, you know, you're climbing a mountain um, or something like that. We give leadership some latitude in there. It's the same thing that the SMA was talking about earlier, too, right, that in terms of if you're in an environment that's very high altitude or high temperatures, um, you know, it, it, when it was listed in 7-22 as well, um, you know, when it applied to like combat environments, you know, we, we don't have to do it in combat environments. But leadership should make sure that the environment is uh, the best it can be um, for them to take the test because you don't want to disadvantage your soldiers. But, um, you know, that's also not an excuse for you to not take the test. You're just looking for the optimal conditions. You got a blizzard or something like that going on. It's probably not the time to do it. You may want to slide it a little bit. Same thing if it's in the middle of the day and you're in Fort Bliss, Texas. You know, you may want to adjust the time. It's same same kind of parameters. Um, sir, another thing um, we did do um, a uh, like a drag coefficient for if you want to do a sprint drag carry, you know, on a parking lot. And believe it or not. We did it on a parking lot. Some people said, well, I, maybe I don't have grass. So can I do a, a sprint drag carry in a parking lot? And what's the drag coefficient? Did that increase or decrease? Actually, it doesn't, didn't. And, uh, you know, unfortunately for me, um, we tested this down at CIMT, and I had to do uh, a drag in uh, the grass. Then I had to do a drag in uh, the parking lot. And then I did the drag in the gym. The only, and the only difference was on the drag coefficient for a like a gym surface, we would add weight because uh, the gym, if you did it strictly on a gym floor, not just inside on, you know, an artificial turf, the drag coefficient was less and it would slide more. So we added weight. I think it was uh, not, you know, 90 pounds. We doubled it. Yeah, we doubled it. Yeah. So that drag coefficient inside the gym on a gym floor, not a um artificial turf uh, would be uh, less so therefore you added the weight um i believe that's what you're asking i don't think that changed um, that way you can do it pretty much anywhere and somebody says oh you're going to tear up my sked skeds those skeds were built for the army perspective were really relatively inexpensive so if you tore up the sked by using it on a parking lot we just order another little sked pad all right uh, SMA, our next question comes from the Kansas National Guard. Hey, good evening, SMA. This is First Sergeant Coppins with the Kansas Army National Guard. The question we had from the state is more in line with um, looking at the deadlift versus the leg tuck. If you look at it, why was it removed? But that was a question you've also already answered earlier as far as measuring the, the true core. Um, so that answered the question already, but the, the secondary question to it was more, when looking at the deadlift, have they considered changing the uh, the actual grip bar deadlift? For some of the female soldiers in the state have mentioned, sometimes it's harder for them to get a good grip just because the bars are a little bit thicker versus your actual pull-up bar that we were using. Uh, Yeah, we haven't actually looked at uh, making the bar any changes. Um, probably one of the big reasons we haven't done that is the number one past event is the max deadlift. So pretty much everybody passes it. So not everybody, but there's a lot of people that actually pass uh, the max deadlift. So um, nobody's, we didn't see that in the study. Nobody's made that recommendation um, because believe it or not, uh, the most failed event was the two mile run, um, and again, we're not we're not trying to design a PT. PT the goal, ultimate goal, was not just to go, okay, let's uh, 
you know, make it so everybody passed. What we really wanted to do is increase fitness. That's why you had the six, you know, uh, events on the PT test that measures all 10 components of fitness. Um, but right now, like I said, there was no, we've seen no data on people not being able to, to execute that event. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, SMA, our next question uh, comes from social media, and it's, uh, I think, for Sergeant Major Rains. Uh, so I'll get him here on the screen. Uh, and essentially, the, the question gets after the, the different um, uh, titles and authorities, and, and if there's any change to the timelines for like a Title 10 versus Title 32, 32 National Guard. National Guard. No, um, when, when you look at our titles and you look at our statuses, there, there's really only two things that come into consideration. Are, are, they, are they on extended active duty orders? Are they uh, on a traditional uh, schedule? It doesn't matter if they're under the governor's control or they're under uh, a commander's control on the Title 10 side. Um, if they're active duty and serving on an extended active duty order for over 90 days, they will go by the active duty uh, timeline. If they're on a traditional, um, you know, um, status, they will go by the one that we've been calling the Army National Guard uh, timeline. But but really, that status is what dictates what timeline they will be on. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, going back to social media again, uh, one of the things that I uh, may be confusing for some of the people out there is when we talk about uh, making this a, a general fitness assessment, um, it seems that that they're being confused at these events, that uh, these exercises, uh, we're not using them to predict performance on warrior tests and battle drills, but uh, can you still talk about uh, the relationship that, that these fitness events and the training in FM7-2 22 still has on your ability to conduct those uh, warrior tests and battle drills and at uh, your metal tasks. And um, I will kind of jump in, but Gerald Klein usually gives us uh, does a much better job than I do. <laughs> so, um, so basically, I would say it still measures more components of fitness, and that's what the the Rand study also said that the the Army combat fitness test is is better than the old test, and I think it says it right up front. It says, "Yeah, you need to." We made some recommendations. They didn't just go, "Hey, you know, you just stop it all together." So, um, but when you read the Rand study, we were trying to validate, um, and that's why when you read it, there's a lot of statements about validity. It's not that it's a bad test or it doesn't measure good, you know. Um, more components of fitness. It doesn't say, you know, it's not a better test than the old test. It's just that they were trying, and what we'd asked them to do was validate that uh, this was uh, exactly what we were trying to do on the warrior task and battle drill simulation test. And a couple of those things they said they couldn't validate. Uh, but, and I'll turn it over to General Klein to talk about, you know, how the, it measures the other components of fitness. Yeah, thanks, SMA. And I, you know, we love this question because it's really important in terms of the narrative, right? Um, and all of you readers on the on the screen here, you can help with this narrative. But they, uh, we we started the looking at this about 2012. Um, we had a, all the right people um, working on the ACFT, and then you know 2019 when we came out with version 1.0. But there was a, a a series of studies that we did, your Army did, to um, connect the linkage, if you will, between your warrior task and battle drills and the ACFT. They started off with, uh, when they looked at all the warrior task and battle drills, they started off with the 25 most physically demanding um, things you needed to do, you know, of the tasks. And we developed exercises that, you know, over time got necked down to the six events that we have right now. So there's a lot of science and thought that went into the development of these particular events. And as the SMA alluded, you know, as he stated before, um, you know, this is a test now that measures all 10 components of physical fitness. Um, the APFT was really focused on one, and that was physical endurance. ACFT is when you get into 
uh, I'm sorry, muscular endurance was the APFT. Now you got muscular endurance, you got muscular strength, power, flexibility, agility, aerobic capacity. Uh, and so it's a you know much more well-rounded test. And if you are active in functional fitness, you're going to do better on this test because um, that's what this test is uh, designed to do. It's certainly going to make you more ready out there as well. So um, hopefully that answers the question. We just couldn't, we just couldn't make the, the final connection. And a lot of it came down to um, female sample size, honestly. Um, we just didn't have enough females in the sample for us to, uh, for, you know, it, it lost uh, validity. Joan Fine, uh, while I have you, a uh, question from social media about increasing the limit of four soldiers in a testing line. I believe the XORD uh, says five uh, per grader on the plank, um, but can you can you elaborate if you if you happen to, to know that? No, I think this comes down to, to answer your question, no, not off the top of my head. I think this comes down to just a, a grader's ability to be able to observe so many people that are in a you know, particular position. There was concern initially when we said we were only going to do the plank and within my headquarters and within the, uh, the planning team was, what was this going to do in terms of this idle time? If everybody was, hypothetically was able to max, you know, at, you know, three and a half minutes or whatever the case may be, you could have this big lag of time in there while you're doing individual uh, you know, planking. Um, and so we, we, we expanded that. Um, and I think it is four right now. So, right. So, sorry, Major, I, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure, I think we extended it to five because of that. Uh, I thought it was five. Okay. I think we changed it okay. next. Yeah. Either way, a, a good example that, you know, these LPDs are good. The chain teaches are, are good. There's a lot of video, a lot of resources on army.mil slash ACFT, but, uh, nothing replaces the policy and doctrine and, and exhort. And so encourage all of our soldiers and leaders uh, that exhort and or the Army directive uh, is available at army.mil slash ACFT. Um, yeah. And sorry, Rainier, on this point, uh, before we uh, close it out is, you know, units will figure this out, too. <laughs> so um, I'll use the example in the beginning. Uh, we thought. And, you know, if you go way back, you know, three years ago, the first test is like, oh, my goodness, we got to have every weight in every lane. And then we figured out because if that's what it originally was, like all these weights were in one lane. You had walked up and you could put your weight on that lane. And they're like, man, that's probably not the way to do that. It's like, why didn't we do the deadlift? And, you know, those that could do, you know, heavier weight would go to the heavier weight lane and those would do less go to the less weight lane. So... You know, I think those are the things we're going to figure out. We're going to figure out how to do this. You know, a, a good first sergeant will figure this out in a nanosecond. Um, you know, you know, the, I think the the spirit and intent will be done um, and to measure the fitness. But um, I wouldn't get wrapped up in too much on exactly this is the way it's always been done. Now you can't change the order. You can't do any of that. That's you know that's it's it's designed in that order to be done that way. But there'll be little tweaks that uh, I think people will figure out on how to, to do this in, a, in an efficient manner. All right, gentlemen, I think uh, we're kind of coming up to the end of our time uh, here, but I do want to just um, go back around and uh, Sergeant Major Raines, uh, beginning with you, uh, if there's anything that you would uh, just kind of like to, like to uh, Hey, I, I would just like uh, to, to thank everybody for 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 tuning in uh, to the uh, chain teach, if you would. Uh, SMA, thank you. Uh, thank General Klein for uh, for being with us this evening, and then to uh, all, all the soldiers uh, that that are listening right now. Hey, we got an ACFT now, and, and it's time to get started. And uh, we should have already got started. But uh, there's still opportunity for those who have put it off to uh, never too late to get the body in motion. And, and I will be visiting a camp post our station, our, our state uh, uh, with you soon. And, and I would love to take the ACFT with your units when you're out there doing the diagnostic test. So uh, so so hey, hit me up and uh, invite me out to, uh, to to see what you got on the ACFT. Uh, that's all I've got. I appreciate it. 
Thank you so much, Sergeant Major. And uh, sir, anything uh, from your perspective? Um, uh, we One thing we didn't talk about was uh, H2F and, and how uh, that relates to uh, National Guard. Um, just any final thoughts there? Sure. Yeah, you, you, for those of you that are, you know, watching uh, what the active component is doing with AC uh, with uh, H2F, um, yes, it's predominantly uh, that the resourcing you're seeing anyway um, with, uh, you know, these teams that are getting embedded with brigades um, was uh, it's, it's it's it was a uh, a uh, um, initiative that was uh, resourced by um, the chief. It's at the center point of putting people first, but it was primarily active component as it relates to the teams that are embedded with the brigades. Break. That being said, the philosophy, the idea behind H2F is multi-compo. Absolutely is. And so if you're if you're looking in 7-22, and you, it's, I would encourage everybody to get familiar with the five domains and what does that mean for your formations. Um, and in many cases, the uh, resources are available to you, but they just may not be co-located in one particular soldier performance readiness center, as the ca case may be for the active component. Army wellness centers are still available to you. The master fitness trainers are still available. Um, so look at what you can do within your own formation. And in a lot of cases, you may, I would encourage you to, you know, invite a registered dietitian to come over to your formation and talk about nutrition. Um, have an occupational therapist come over and talk about um we know what they bring to the fight and that's that's the kind of the idea behind it we'll have a we got a big thing that's planned this month um i think the sma is coming down as well i think even the cx coming down we're going to do an industry day down here and so hopefully we'll uh, have some great conversations and kind of help put this together i i would coming off of uh, h2f um for those of you that may not know this i think this is, might be the 20th time that your sergeant major of the army has addressed crowds out there it's something like that. I think this might be his last one that is uh, actually scheduled. Um, I can see the smile on his face. Uh, um, he has been through now years of uh, fighting this fight, so we're super proud of what he's done to, to spike the ball and put this, uh, get this test across the line. So thank you, SMA, for, for what you've done. Um, I would also say don't shoot for the minimum. Shoot for the max. Don't get hung up on what the minimum scores are and you think, oh, well, this is, you know, we, we lowered the bar or any of these other conversations. Um, you know, I, if, if you can't max it, stay out of that conversation. Shoot for the max. And then lastly, uh, SMA, uh, blink twice if you are being held captive. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. We'll, we'll call off the Rangers. They're not coming to your house anymore. You're safe. Uh, but thanks for thanks everybody for dialing in. Thank you, sir. And, and SMA, I, I couldn't uh, let you completely off the hook. We had one last question come in, something uh, especially for this audience. Uh, I wanted to make sure we address. So uh, from NGB, uh, we'll turn it over to Sergeant Olays. How are you getting closing comments and then ask one more question? <laughs> It's a good one, I promise. Hi, SMA. I'm Staff Sergeant Elias from NGB. Uh, for soldiers who are not located near their armory, what advice would you have for soldiers to get creative on training or finding equipment to practice on? Um, well, I think General Klein said it several times. It's getting the in the Army uh, training publication. Uh, it's got a lot of good exercises on body weight. Um, I, I've done a lot of those. Uh, basically because of COVID. Um, when COVID shut down all the gyms, like everywhere, active, guard, like every gym was closed. Um, you know, I didn't stop doing fitness. I'm hoping everybody else didn't either. So there's a lot of good body weight things you can do. And believe it or not, uh, two good sandbags actually uh, are really helpful. You can do a sprint drag carry. You can do your standing power throw. Um, you can do standing power jumps, you can do deadlifts, you can do all kinds of things with a couple sandbags. Um, so if you don't have like a whole bunch of equipment, there's that. And there's even when you go to the master fitness school, they show you how to do all that with a duffel bag. So believe it or not, they give you some exercises that will actually show you how to use weight in a duffel bag to do um, to get better for the Army combat fitness test. So they'll give you things that you just have right there. Uh, that you're issued or you're assigned to the soldiers. But there's all kinds of equipment all over the place. I'd say 
it may not be at your armory. Well, what about the recruiting stations that have um, equipment? Because we issued all the recruiters uh, stuff to do the OPAT. And one of the tests for the OPAT is a deadlift. So, and what about an ROTC program? So there's also ROTC programs. Those are active component soldiers. They'll have equipment. You just got to go out. So there's a lot more equipment and things and resources that are available to you. Uh, but bottom line, you really don't need any of that because there's a lot of great body weight. And if you can't do the body weight, there's uh, other methods. Like like I said, they literally have a, um, a designed uh, method to help you out with the things like this. It's either a rucksack or a duff bag that you can use for weight and just put your, your gear in there and then still do some of the, the training with it. So I encourage you all to go ahead and do that. So hopefully that answers your questions. And uh, are there any more questions? No, SMA, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call it here and uh, turn it to you for closing remarks. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll just close. Uh, it sounds like uh, uh, John Sergeant Major Raines uh, has owned up to do a lot more ACFTs. And um, I will challenge you that, uh, you know, Sergeant Major Sampa actually beat me on the sprint direct carry. He was really proud of that. So no pressure there on on you as you go out do, doing that. Uh, so and then congratulations to you being selected the Army National Guard Sergeant Major. Really proud of you and all the work. And we've known each other for a while. And uh, General Klein, thank you for those kind of remarks. Uh, we've uh, I've had a partner in crime, and it's been uh, the center initial, initial military training with uh, General Hibbert and yourself now, and both of you have been excellent partners um, as we've been in this journey uh, a long time. I have not been in this journey alone, and I really appreciate um, all your uh, help and your guidance, and you've been a, an outstanding teammate. And I appreciate it. And um, and in closing, I'll just say for those soldiers that are out there, uh, we're really proud of you. Um, we're proud of all the work that you've done for, to, to save your country uh, through COVID, uh, national disasters, all the things that I mentioned before. So um, we're going to continue to call on the Army National Guard. And your focus uh, is uh, be ready when your nation calls uh, we're not going to ask, you know, hey, are you fit and you're ready to go? The nation's not going to call and say, hey, is your you know, is your equipment ready? Uh, we're not going to ask any of that. We're just going to say, OK, it's time to go and it's time to go now. And that's how our country's been with us. And we've never let them down. And you all have never let us down on any mission that we've asked you to do. Uh, and that's going to continue in the future. And uh, I'm extremely proud of all of you and all that you've done for your country. And yes, I am safe and secure. So uh, have a wonderful day and thank you for joining us.